I want you to hit me as hard as you can. I'm Lance Felchuk for Arrow in the Heads the Black Sheep, where we discuss and defend the genre's most divisive films. I've said it before, and I will say it again, the passage of time eludes me. I mean, how is it almost Christmas? It seems like just yesterday I was outside the Don in a hot tub, looking out at the ocean, and without a second thought. Winter. I've always wished that there were more quality horror films set during the Christmas season. The chilly atmosphere and the backdrop of snow has always seemed a bit sinister to me. I mean, trust me, there's nothing calming about a Chicago winter. In fact, I feel the same way about winter as Kinnison does about marriage. Because if you get married, Mike, that's going to be your fucking face every day. The new update on Black Christmas was just released. And uh, let's see if it drums up support or, uh, you know, at least makes more of a wave than the much maligned 06 movie. Personally, I'm good. I already got my gory slasher, and I don't think this movie is really made for me in mind. But hey, I hope it does well and finds its audience. Now, I'd like to stick with the season and tackle one of my favorite films. A story that never seemed to gain much traction, and though not universally despised, I feel like its lack of credit and mid-range review scores make this prime for a black sheep defense. So for Christmas, let's talk about the Mothman prophecies. The story of the Mothman could be its own video, but the O2 film took elements from John Keel's 1977 novel and turned it into a fictional narrative. In Point Pleasant, West Virginia, between November 1966 and December 1967, there were multiple sightings of a mysterious creature and some odd happenings that came with it. The movie I'm here to talk about intertwines these reports with a story about death and grief. We start with Washington Post columnist John Klein and wife Mary signing off in their first house with an impromptu closet f which is something most of us can relate to either out of experience or want, but a little bit of christening goes a long way in humanizing and relating to these characters. Oh, oh! Uh, here you are. We were, we were just making sure there was adequate closet space. Good, good. Well, I've got great news. This house is yours if you want it. But you're going to have to make a decision right now. We'll take it. Gear pulls off calm and romantic like a pro. And Messing seems generally sweet and caring and, and pulls off dramatic quite well. So the character of Mary is set up to die. But with the little screen time she has, someone as skilled as Messing gives her a lot of heart. She emotes, cries, and regrets in a way that hooked me immediately. A couple years later, John skips a blind date to get down to Richmond, Virginia, bitterly for work. He somehow ends up a hundred miles away and lands in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and got there in a time frame deemed impossible. With Ohio. This. This right here is what drew me in and is essentially why I love this film. The Mothman Prophecies could have been a straightforward monster movie more grounded and closely followed the book. You see, what Pellington went for was far more supernatural. Point Pleasant acts as a Bermuda Triangle of sorts. Time doesn't quite work the same here, and the unexplained happenings are directly tied to the Mothman visiting, something extraterrestrial with a pinch of demonology. John's car breaks down in Point Pleasant and rightfully goes to the closest house to ask for help, and this still gives me chills. Two nights ago, at 2.30 in the a.m., there's a bang on the door. I open it up and here's this guy. He says he wants to use a phone, but there's something just creepy about him, right? So I tell him to get lost. Now I've seen criticisms calling this just an overlong, overbloated X-Files episode. And uh, okay, this does have an X-Files feel to it, but more like that amazing first movie and the season six peak. Shut up, Mulder. I'm playing baseball. Oh! We're using the X-Files as a criticism, for God's sakes. There are a lot of unexplained things that make this feel like everyone is going crazy. Whether it's voices coming from a sink drain, or John's dead wife walking out of the police station she was clearly in. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't imagined. Something that took her look was physically there, which is fucking creepy. Is it her? Was it her? 
That's your wife? <laughs> it was her. What some critics took issue with is actually what the film does best, this sort of disorientation. You never quite know what's real or not. The Mothman is on a plane of existence we can't comprehend. That direction elevates this into a more interesting film. For instance, when John is talking on the phone, his reflection doesn't quite match. Then we get a quick flash of the Mothman, or, or maybe Ingrid Cold. The directing by Pellington is great, it's interesting, and it gives the story life. We get a bunch of creepy aerial shots, showing the town from the would-be perspective of the Mothman. Many times, the characters are framed from a high and wide shot. You get the sense of how insignificant we are to something that powerful. Something is always above, uh, always watching. John's rock, if you will. And all of this is the great Laura Linney. Laura plays Officer Connie Mills, the grounded skeptic that knows something odd is at play, but uh, she tries to be reasonable and pragmatic. Now, as a natural skeptic myself, I'd say they handle her character very well. The Scully type is always a tightrope walk. We, the audience, already know the creature is real, so you need to keep the skepticism fair or risk the character coming off stubborn and unlikable. Connie's a sweetheart who cares about her community and believes them when they say shit ain't right. Seeing a UFO is one thing. What do you do when someone comes into your office and tells you they saw this in their backyard? Gear and Linny have a natural chemistry, as they work together on the underappreciated. Well, I don't know, is it? You know, nobody really talks about primal fear anymore, so either it's underrated or uh, I'm just getting old. Either way, as, as adversaries, they were amazing and bring that same charm here only as allies. As John seemingly spirals out of control, even if I'd argue is completely justified in this situation, Connie keeps him grounded and is there for support. The real story here is John's grief and regret. He only cares, he's only motivated because he believes he may be able to reconnect with his deceased wife. It's heartbreaking to see a decent guy just want to see his girl once more. Then there's Indrid Cold in what may be one of the most unsettling characters this century. Cold is the human form the Mothman takes, or at least that's what we're led to believe. The vagueness actually works in the film's favor here. What do you look like? It depends on who's looking. And he, or, or it, is damn near brilliant. And special shout out to Will Patton as the scene stealer Gordon Mills, who is the only one that directly deals with cold, you know, except when he's talking to John over the phone. Now, there's been many classics that have terrified us with a voice. There's Black Christmas, When a Stranger Calls, and Scream, to name a few. Yet, Indrid Cold may be the creepiest one, not even close to being human, but trying to pass itself off as one. His tone chills me to the bone. What's the third line? Page 51. A broken smile beneath her whispered smiles. Proof, Having this character always one step ahead, almost conducting everything, it keeps things tense. And honestly, it's a cool idea for exposition without seeming forced. The Mothman itself is just sort of around, an omen of a tragedy to come. And it's these stories that John becomes obsessed with. But Indrid Cold is the face of the mystery. John Klein is the audience. You know, things never quite match up. Everything is filtered through the perspective of the storyteller. And like I said earlier, it's disorienting, a fever dream. A quick side note, the score by Tom and Andy does a lot to complement the craziness. Somewhat industrial, pulsating, mix this with the frantic camera work. And you got yourself a nail biter. It's the tour. You can't do it, you can't go. Cancel it, cancel the tour, cancel it. Make them shut down the plant now. And since this movie is 17 years old, I will have no qualms about spoiling it. You know, if for some reason you're watching a review on a movie you've never seen. John's journey comes to an end in the beautiful and spooky scene where he goes home to Washington after being told of a call he will get from Mary. Now, Connie calls to intercept, and knowing whatever is on the other line won't actually be his wife. She wants him back for Christmas Eve, hence my loose Christmas tie-in. And it's this letting go that completes his journey. This gets him back in time to help with the tragedy on the River Ohio. What exactly is the Mothman or Indrid Cold? What is its true purpose? It doesn't matter. Life is full of the unexplained, and I love that this will happen again and again in different parts of the world. 
John has accepted that his wife Mary is truly gone and that we don't get to come back. I've loved movies since I can remember and many have never been on a critic's top 10 list. I'm the dude that loves Last Action Hero and Goodwill Hunting with the same passion. But all I've ever wanted to do was give support and appreciation for the films deemed unloved, uncool. So with Christmas and New Year's coming up, do me a favor, give one film labeled unpopular a chance. Don't let IMDb, Metacritic, or Rotten Tomatoes dictate what you are willing to see. I always think that it's a blink of the eye and another year gone. And one day you'll awake and have more time behind you than in front. I know where I'm going, but I'm not sure where I've been. Time is nigh. The time is nigh. So if you want to do something, do it. Life is quicker than you think. You love film? Good. Write a blog, make a video, learn a skill, and improve on it. Any level of accomplishment comes straight through failure, and fail you must. Most of the time, things come through in the end, and I often think of what Bill Hicks said at the end of his life. This is just a ride. So come along and take that ride. It's all right.